from Austin Street Baptist Church as we are bringing you Sunday School lesson. And this one is on spiritual warfare and, and putting on the armor of God. And before we get started in the lesson, I want to read you uh, uh, some comments out of my teacher's quarterly. Because I do believe that this is one of the things that most Christians are the weakest on because it's hard for us to understand that we're not in a physical battle, we're in a spiritual battle. And I want you to hear what this says. No one is immune to this conflict. It is not a physical war, it's a spiritual battle. Christians might, might not always think in those terms, but the battle is still there. Only by realizing we're in this fight can we stand against Satan and his wilds. He provides a spirit, uh, speaking of God, he provides a spiritual armor by which we can engage the enemy and stand strong. You'll notice something in this lesson. It doesn't tell us to run an attack. It doesn't tell us uh, that at all. Either three or four different times it tells us to stand. When we put the armor on to stand for God. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be in Ephesians uh, 6 chapter in the 10th verse. Father, thank you for today and Father, help us to understand that we're in a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. And Father, also help us to understand that you've given us, if we'll only take it, all the things that are necessary to stand against Satan and his group. Father, bless the lesson. May it touch somebody's heart, including mine. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As Paul is finishing up in the book of Ephesians, we've had all these very difficult lessons, and then Paul starts out in the 10th verse of Ephesians 6, and he said, finally, he didn't ask for, he said, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Are you strong in the Lord? Am I strong in the Lord? Paul said, absolutely. Finally, we're down to this place, this time, be strong in the Lord. And we'll never be strong if it's not in the Lord. Verse 11. Put on the full armor of God. You can't put on one or two pieces or three or four pieces. If you don't use all of the armor, you're leaving a window open in this spiritual battle for Satan to attack you and attack the people around you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power Put on the full armor of God, and this is the reason, so that you can, can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That's what this whole lesson is about, is how do we take our stand against Satan's attack on us and our New Testament church and the people around us. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Did you hear that? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. I don't know if this is absolutely correct or not, but I'm going to give it to you because it makes sense. It came out of one of my study books. 
and it's going to divide those things that it tells us that uh, uh, we fight against and give some names to it and what it uh, could be or is. Principalities. That's oversight of the nations. Now this is a worldwide battle. And they'd be classified as generals. Powers are the privates. That's the ones that we stand against one against one as they try their schemes to get us off. And rulers of the darkness, worldly high places, over religion. Over religion. Do you believe that? What about Sunday morning at Austin Street Baptist Church? Would you think Satan or some of his group will be in church on Sunday morning? And why? And what will they try to do? They will absolutely be at Austin Street Sunday morning. They'll try to get the pastor to preach a feel-good sermon. They'll reason with him. Don't preach something hard. The church needs to grow. Tell the people something that make them feel good. The deacon will be over with his lips stuck out because he thinks nobody knows what all he does at church and they don't pat him on the back enough and tell him how good he is. The teacher, try to keep him from being prepared. He'll put people in the class that will try to read it, lead the lesson off into Never Never Land. The individual person at Austin Street, Satan will try to do something to keep the Holy Spirit from controlling the service on Sunday morning at Austin Street Baptist Church. Maybe that's in your mind that person that said something tacky to you three months ago and he'll bring it to your mind. Satan will be at Austin Street Baptist Church on Sunday morning and all other New Testament churches. And let me give you some examples if you don't think Satan doesn't take come in to where believers are at. The night before Jesus was arrested, It tells us that Satan went into the heart of Judas in the upper room. How about Peter? Four or five hours later, after he told Jesus, I would die, I would die physically before I would ever say, that you're anything but who you are. And there he stood three times and denied that he even knew Jesus Christ. Satan is alive and well. Let me tell you a story out of Daniel, and maybe it'll even give you a little insight. Daniel's such a great book. At the end of Daniel, Daniel asked a question of God. And God gave him an answer that he didn't really understand. And Daniel began to pray. And he prayed and he asked God to come and reveal to him what he needed to know. And a week went by and Daniel prayed. And two weeks went by and Daniel prayed. And three weeks, 21 days went by. And Daniel had not heard a word from God. He'd quit eating, he'd quit drinking, he was down on the river, prostrate, praying to God. 
And finally he found, felt a touch on the shoulder and there was an angel there that answered his prayer, told him what Daniel needed to know. And then he went on to tell him this. He said, Daniel, your prayer was heard on the first day you began to pray in heaven your prayer was heard. And I was sent to bring you the answer, but I was conflicted by the prince of Persia, another name for Satan, and I could not bring the word to you until Michael came out of heaven and helped me bring this message to you. We're in a spiritual warfare. Therefore, because these things are true, put on the full armor of God. And we're going to spend most of the rest of the lesson about what the armor is, what it does, and maybe even a little bit about how we're to put it on. When you think about the full armor of God, what you need to think about is us putting Christ on. Each one of these things that God will give us protection with is something that Christ has already done for us or is in the process of doing for us, or will do for us. So when it says put on the full armor of God, it could just it could just as easy be put on all of Christ. Put on all of Christ. Okay, let's talk about the full armor of God. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, and this is the reason, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, is your life such that you've done everything to stand for God? Stand firm then, again and again in this passage, it tells us to stand for God. Not to attack. Satan will do the attacking. But it tells us to take a stand for God. And he gives us different things to make that possible. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Belt, that's the first piece. Truth, that's what comes with it. And let me read you, I have a deal in my Bible and I'm going to read you a little deal about each piece of armor as we put them on. Satan fights with lies and sometimes his lies sound like the truth but only believers, did you hear that? Only believers have God's truth which can defeat Satan's lies. Jesus said, I am the truth. So if you have Jesus, you have the truth. Read the book. See what the truth said. Put that on. Wrap that belt around you. Then that day they wore long robes, go plumb to the ground, so when battle time came, they would take the hem of those garments, pull them up, stick them in the belt so they could move around, and they also had a weapon attached to the belt. The belt of truth is the first thing you're supposed to put on. Get yourself ready for the battle. Study the book. Listen to what scripture says. 
so you will recognize whether what you're hearing is true or not true. The second one is the breastplate of righteousness. Now there's two kinds of righteousness. There's the God-given righteousness, which none of us will have a personal righteousness if we have not accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But the breastplate was to protect this part of the body where the heart and all these things, all these vital organs were, But you know, we're supposed to have a personal righteousness too. We're supposed to be living for God, standing for God. So the breastplate of righteousness, Satan often attacks our hearts. The seed of our emotions, God, uh, uh, Satan does mess with our emotions. Self-worth and trust, God's righteousness is the breastplate that protects our heart and ensures his approval. He approves of us because he loves us and sent his son to die for us. So we got a belt. We got the stuff that might get in the way tucked into the belt. Then we put on the breastplate of righteousness, God's righteousness, our righteousness, for protection of our emotions and our vital organs. And with your feet, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's our foot gear. Satan wants us to think that telling others the good news is a waste of time. The size of the task is too big. The negative responses are too much to handle. And if you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will get some negative kickback. Now God will tell us when it's the time to share. But the footgear of God gives us the motivation to continue to proclaim the true peace that is available in God. News everyone needs to hear. If you're a Christian, somebody shared it with you. Either your mother or your daddy or your Sunday school teacher or the preacher. Somebody shared with you about who Jesus is and what he wants to do in your life. So it says the footgear. Now to the Roman soldiers, that meant a heavy-duty sandal with spikes on the bottom of the sandals to give them traction when they got ready to fight. We need traction. We need an understanding, something that's been built up from the ground floor to be ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. And I want you to listen really, really close about the shield of faith. Now, the, to the Roman soldier, the shield of their heavy infantry was about the size of a door. And it had a wooden frame and it had this tough leather over it to protect their whole body. Their whole body. But it says it's a shield of faith. Well, they had faith that when the enemy began to shoot the arrows and throw the things at them, if they would get behind that shield and hold on real tight, that none of those arrows would reach them. 
and they would actually, the heavy infantry would stand and, and they would stand behind those shields until the enemy used up all their ammunition and then they brought in the other people and they would begin the attack. But what is a shield of faith? It's your belief that God is who he says he is and who he's been proven to be and it's Jesus that was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, performed the miracles that said he did, called the people he called, was arrested, beaten, crucified, physically died, arose three days later, and is in heaven now, and he's coming back one of these days. Now the reason you need that faith so bad is because sometime in your life, something's going to happen to you that you don't understand. Someone you love is going to die way too early. Someone's going to do something to you that shouldn't have been done. And I'll give you an example that was in one of my books. This preacher was over where they were digging in some of the artifacts uh, from Jesus' time. And this guy asked him, what are you going to do if they dig up something that looks like it contradicts what the scripture says? And he said, I'm going to depend on the shield of faith and that flaming arrow will not kill me. The shield of faith. It protects the whole body. But that shield is just as big as what our faith means. Do you really, really believe in Jesus? You know, there were times, there were people in Jesus' times that they could say all the right words. They had the vocabulary done good. It said they even done some miracles. And they went to Jesus and said, look at us. We're something special. And Jesus said some of the saddest words in all of Scripture to him, depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you. Do you have the right kind of faith? So the shield will be up and Satan's arrows will hit the sh uh, shield? What we see are Satan's attacks in the form of insults, setbacks, temptation, but the shield of faith protects us from Satan's flaming arrows. With God's perspective, we can see beyond our circumstances and know that the ultimate victory is ours. The ultimate victory is one of these days Jesus is coming back for his people and he's taking them home. And this old world and all of its flaming arrows and all the things that are going on will wake up one day and there's going to be a bunch of people gone and they're not going to have a clue why. Is your faith strong enough? Do you really believe in the real Jesus? Now we're going to put on a helmet. Verse 17 said, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Well, you know, we're supposed to have salvation. How do, how do we put the helmet of salvation on? Satan wants us to 
wants to make us doubt God. Satan deals with your mind. Do you hear me? Satan wants us to doubt God, Jesus, and our very salvation. Most all of us at one time or another have doubted our salvation when we get to thinking what it cost and what uh, what we are we have trouble understanding that God could love somebody like us but he does the helmet protects our minds do you hear that part the helmet protects our minds from doubting God's saving work for us. That helmet protects our minds when Satan comes in and starts telling you things and challenging your belief and all these things and you look around and if you're not careful you say, seem like I'm the only one that's, that's believing in Jesus. There were people at that time that thought, they're the only one in the Old Testament. And God said, you don't, have, you don't have a clue how many there are. You don't have a clue how many there are. Now it tells us in this that we only have one offensive weapon. I believe there's two, but we, we will, we'll talk about that. The next one, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now we've got shoes on, we've got a breastplate on, we've got a helmet on, we've got a belt on, and we've got a sword. And the sword is the Word of God. And it tells us that that's the only offensive weapon, but I, we'll talk about that in just a minute. The sword is the only weapon of offense in the list of armor. There are times when we need to take the off offensive against Satan. When we are tempted, we need to trust in the truth of God's word. We need to trust and the truth of God's Word. That's the soul. That's the book. If it's on the shelf at home and you never open it up, it's not doing you any good. Oh, what most of the world would give to have the opportunity to have the resources that we have in the United States of America. Now you look at our country right now and you wonder, well, why is it going like it is? It's showing all the effects of being a lost world. I believe there's one other weapon. And pray. And I believe that's our other offensive weapon. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions. All occasions. With all different kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints, including yourself. You know, there's all different kinds of prayers a prayer of confession, a prayer of praise our want list. Sometimes God takes our want list and cuts it down to our need list. But it says, keep on praying. Pray for yourself, but especially pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And being part of a New Testament church, we need to pray for our pastor, his wife, and all the different people in the New Testament church, we need to help 
hold up a hedge around the people in our church, including yourself. Prayer does make a difference. Does, does God always give us what we ask for? No, he absolutely does not. There's three answers on our prayer. Yes, we like that one. No, we don't like that one. Wait a while. We pretty much don't like that one because we're so impatient. But the one thing we can be sure of, we're praying to somebody that loves us more than we can possibly imagine. And he's proved it over and over. But the main way he proved it was to allow his son to come, live, die, and assume the penalty for our sins. How could anyone love you any more than that? Paul said, verse 19, pray also for me. Paul's in prison when he writes Ephesians. He's been there for quite a long time. And I'm sure Paul's saying, let me out of here. Pray that God will get me out of here. Let's see if that's what he said. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. He didn't ask that they pray for him to get out of prison. Paul said, pray that I'll make the best use of of this time that I'll have the words to say in the mystery of the gospel is Jesus Christ. For which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. You know, even though we're not a preacher or a teacher or someone that shares the gospel publicly on a platform, maybe more of us ought to pray that God will give us the right words to say at the right time when he brings somebody into our realm that he intends for us to share the good news with. Maybe Jerry ought to pray more for the correct words to say at the correct time. Tychus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus with an undying love. What about this lesson? This is Paul finishing up the book of Ephesians. And he said, first and foremost, we're not in a physical battle, we're in a spiritual battle. And you don't have a chance in the world if you don't utilize the armor that God gives you for this battle. The belt. The breastplate the shoes, the helmet, the sword. Do you use them? Do you put them on? Do 
you stand for God. Let me finish with this. The one thing that you'll notice about the armor of God, it covers the head, covers the chest, takes care of the feet, goes around the waist, and you got a big shield of faith in front of you, but there's not anything to protect your backside. So if we retreat, if we retreat, if we turn our back on God, there is nothing there to keep Satan from attacking us again and again and again. Put on the full armor of God. I love you. God loves you a whole lot more. Take care of your brothers and sisters. If you see one piece of their armor that's not on right, help them put it on. Be willing for someone to show you about another piece of armor for you. We're only protected when we put on all, all of the armor. See you next time. May God bless you and keep you. Bye-bye.